Good morning, friends. Welcome to those of you in the room and online. Uh, thank you to those of you who are helping set up extra chairs in the back. It's great to have a packed house, uh, but more than anything, we want you to know that we don't just love packing the house, but it packs my heart to know you and love you. Uh, if we haven't met yet, my name is Kyle, and even if we haven't met, I love you. I love being your pastor, and we're all on a spiritual journey some way, somehow, and we'd love for you to enc encounter the presence of God, his love, and his people, and just see what God does. He changed my life, and I know he can do the same for you as well. But this morning, let's get into it. Uh, this morning, um, let's talk about politics. Yeah, shall we? Shall we? Yeah. Uh, the reading the room right now is the most awesome. Oh, I've got people like, yeah, this is awesome. We we'll never talk about it. I got people doing like a lot of these, like, what are you talking about, Willis? And I've got some people who are like, oh my gosh, I feel nervous in like parts of my body I didn't know I had before, but they're cleansing up like this. <laughs> and other people are like, is this a joke? No, it's not a joke. But what I think is so interesting is the range of responses that we have to the idea of politics. The emotional responses we have when we walk by, we see someone's flag and what that means. You know, it's interesting, um, about five years ago uh, when I was a college pastor, uh, I was seeing this division happening and I said, man, this is the most divided I have ever seen us. And then two years later, there was a pandemic and I was like, I didn't see this coming. But it's interesting as I was having that conversation with a student who's a history major, he said, yeah, 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 we're incredibly divided, but do you think we're more divided now than we were in the 60s and the midst of a war and protests. If you go back even before that, remember there was this thing called the Civil War? We were pretty divided. And it's interesting thinking about that because as I go back, we're gonna look at a passage today in which we see the same thing of division. And it's interesting because what it reveals to me and to us is that the same problems folks had then are the same folks we had now. Um, and while I wanna blame social media I want to blame uh, uh, the proliferation of, of farther extreme ideologies. I really want to blame politicians because dang, that feels good, doesn't it? <laughs> but what I realized this morning is it's not a new thing. It's not a social media thing. What it is, it's a human thing. And I realize there's something below the surface that throughout human history we've wrestled with, and that is tribalism. It's trying to figure out, are you on my team or the other team? right? Because this is how we stayed safe. When you went into battle, you want to know, are you with me or are you with them, right? You, you, you go in and you're out doing your hunter gathering thing and you see someone you don't know, like, ooh, are you safe? Or are we going to fight for the same bit of hunting and are we willing to fight each other to get it? Because it's all about my survival. If you get it, are you going to share? If I get it, do I got to share? And so this whole thing of tribalism creates this isolation and identity. And when I realize it goes back this far, the good news is that the Bible has answers for us to questions we haven't even learned to ask yet. It gives new categories and breaks categories. And if you're like me and, and you look at the world today, again, speaking of the United States political arena and even around the world, we're not the only ones who are more uh, divided and extreme than in times before because we're all human beings and we all have this issue of tribalism and God sees it and he knows it and his response is gonna blow you away. And what I hope you do today is see two things, both one, see the heart of God and number two, see, okay, if I want the world to be different, how can I be a part of that? Instead of sitting back and going, Ugh, how will the heart of God change my heart and the way that I live in the midst of this tribalism that we've suffered through all of human history? That's what we're looking at today. So if you have a Bible, go to Joshua chapter five. Joshua chapter five, verse 13. We've been in this series in which uh, God has given the people a promise over 500 years ago. He said, this land is gonna be your land. He made a promise and now he's keeping it. Last week they crossed uh, the Jordan River and now this is their first day actually in the land that God has promised. And this is what happens. Uh, Joshua is the leader and he's uh, facing this huge armed city named Jericho with ginormous walls and he's preparing for battle and this is what happens. Verse 13 of Joshua 5. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword 
in his hand. All right, I'd be a little scared. I don't know about you. Uh, I grew up in Bakersfield. I've seen a thing or two in my life, but even I would be like, whoa. Those of you who grew up in Roseville would be like, what is this? I know, it's crazy. Um, <laughs> wait a minute, he just looked up. He sees a, door, a dude with a drawn sword. And Joshua went up to him. <laughs> Bad choice, Josh. Bad choice. He went up to him and he asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Are you for us or are you for our enemies? Is that sword coming for me or are we teaming up, we doing this thing together? Are you for us or are you against us? The man replied, neither. What? Neither? Then why are you here and why you got a sword? Like if... He asked the man, hey, are you for the Israelites or are you from the Canaanites? Neither. Hmm? Wait, wait, wait. Um, are you for the Democrats or the Republicans? Neither. Are you for the Niners or the Raiders? The Niners. <laughs> Let's be clear, right? Let's just be clear. Let's just be clear. Neither, then what are you doing here? Who are you, why are you here, and why do you have a sword? But the man responded, neither. I am the commander of the army of the Lord, and I have come now. Joshua fell down in reverence and asked, what message does the Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for this place where you are standing is holy ground. And Joshua did so. We don't know for sure, but um, I'm going to teach you a big, big theological word that uh, there's this word called a theophany. A theophany um, is this, uh, the word theo is God. Um, fanny just means but or appearance. That's not true. It doesn't mean but, but um, uh, come on, guys. That joke used to kill in junior high group. Okay. Um, <laughs> Theophany, an appearance of God, it's, it's when, it's when uh, uh, some Bible scholars look at it, it seems as though God himself or Jesus himself has showed up in these Old Testament passages and the writers didn't have the language to understand exactly who he is. They knew it was someone special, so they referred to him as the commander of the Lord's army. The reason we think it might be God himself and not just a regular old angel, not that I've had regular old angel experiences, I've had none, but I would probably fall to my face and be scared as well. Um, but he takes off his shoes as a sign of reverence. And in this encounter with God, what he does is he realizes the overwhelming holiness of God and is, deserves to be worshiped. But in the same thing, he also figures out that God is not for one or for the other. It's gotta change him. Now for some of us, whoa, 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 Kyle, I don't really understand it. Like some of you are here like, whoa, whoa, wait, don't wait. Isn't this what's about to happen? Hasn't God said, I've chosen the Israelites and they're gonna kill the Canaanites. Hasn't he picked sides? Isn't this whole thing about uh, God picking one nation over another and that one chosen nation is gonna destroy the other? Isn't that the whole story? And I think if you just look at it superficially and don't look at the details of it, you might think that. And if that's what you believe, you wouldn't be the only one. But if you look at what happens, you see what's really going on. You see, the land of Canaanite worships other gods. And one of the gods they worship is a god of fertility. And one of the ways that they would show their act of trust in the god of fertility, I'm not making this up, is they would literally sacrifice their firstborn child. As if to say, I give this to you because I know you will give me more. And when the God of the universe sees that type of evil, he does not step back and say, you do you, boo. <laughs> no, the God of the universe says, when there's evil and injustice, I will make it right. And if you look at the details, it's not just what they did. Look at this. Uh, a few weeks ago, we looked at this character named Rahab, who's a liar um, and a prostitute. And you'd think she's as far away from God as most people people would think it's possible, but what does God do? God looks at her and says, no, 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 I see your heart to do right and justice. And she's invited, even though she's a Canaanite, invited onto team God, team Yahweh, team Jesus to fight for good, for evil versus evil. And we'll see next week, Israelites who do evil 
Those Israelites are punished. What we realize is that God is not on the side of one tribe or the other. He is on the side of all folks and invite folks to live in a righteous way of living that is a blessing to those around them, particularly this. It's creating a nation that cares for the most vulnerable. Whereas the Canaanites took advantage of the most vulnerable, newborn children. Here, God says, no, 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 we're gonna do this a whole nother way. Are you for us or against us? No, I'm for all folks and I'm for justice and for righteousness. And anyone who wants to follow me and follow my way, they will live and they will thrive. And anyone who says no, then they will deal with the consequences of that. Who are you for? Neither. You know, it's interesting. Um, if you're new to our church, we're so glad you're here. You're gonna get a behind the scenes little family meeting. If you've been around our church, hopefully what I'm about to say doesn't surprise you, but let's just clarify some things. Um, as a, I believe that politics are incredibly important because politics shape policies and policies impact people and people are made in God's image and loved by God. And God wants a world and a society in which all human beings are able to thrive. So politics are incredibly important. But I, as your pastor, and we as a church, have been very clear that we are not going to be talking about or aligning ourselves with some sort of political party or ideology. Why? First and foremost, we wanna be incredibly clear that our number one and ultimate allegiance is always to Jesus. And any allegiance that challenges us for our affections, for our attention, for our investment, or for our identity, we think is a threat to that. And that's the world we live in today, in which our politics become our identity. So number one, it's about our allegiance to Jesus. But number two, let me be clear. We wanna be a church where Democrats and Republicans worship together because we believe all y'all need Jesus. If you don't believe that y'all party needs Jesus, look at whoever's running for president of your party right now. Okay, that's as political as I'm gonna get, I promise, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not sorry, let's just do this thing. We want all folks, I love uh, when people walk in, they're so confused because they see the, bu the, the bumper sticker of the other person there and then they see the bumper sticker, they're like, what kind of church is this? I'm like, well, that's not our primary allegiance. What we hope is our primary allegiance is always to Jesus and all folks can find it. Well, Kyle, but, 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 but doesn't God, in ordering a more a just society, the blessed, doesn't that matter? Yes, it does, but let me be clear. There are things in scripture that are clear, but the politics of it get messy. Let me give you an example. One of the reasons we don't align ourselves is we believe it's crystal clear. I mean, the scripture's overwhelmingly clear that the heart of God is for the marginalized, uh, for the poor, the widow, the orphan, uh, the, the, the foreigner, those who have the least power in society, the power of God says, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna protect them and I'm gonna create a place in which they can thrive. So caring for the poor is non-negotiable if you're um, a Jesus follower, Bible-believing person. If that's, it's just not a debate. But here's what is a debate. Is the best way to care for the marginalized through the creation of government programs or the empowerment of the individual. That is a political thing and we can debate about that. And I hope you do. And I hope what you do is come together with people who say, okay, we believe in Jesus. We believe that we need to care for the poor, but let's actually talk about the best way to do that. You see, it's interesting there's this hidden thing that um, we don't talk about. So let me just get it out in the air. Let me just reveal the secret. Um, we're launching small groups and I hope every single one of you sign up for small groups. And here's some of the little, the secret behind it is we know people make friends best with folks who are like them. Same age and stage, same hobbies, whatever that may be, you know. Um, uh, typically, re retired folks like to hang out with retired folks because they wanna play golf at 10 and have dinner at four and... Uh, <laughs> and I wish I could, man, I wish I could! You know what I mean? Come on, yeah, you're newly retired. Like, when do I get to do that? Um, and I get that. And I think you say that to uh, someone with young kids being like, hey, do you? Well, actually the, the dinner at four for young, people with young kids, that actually may work. Maybe we got something here. Okay, let me get to the point. We connect best and make friends most easily with folks who are like us. But we grow the most with people who are not like us. When we look at someone and be like, your life experience was what? Wait, you believe, huh? Wait, how, wait. We've been in this small group for eight weeks and I thought we were on the same team and I realized, you voted for the bad guy. 
I guess I gotta say bad girl. Now. Whatever, whatever. Again, I'm not trying to make a, a, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm, wait, 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 help me understand. And instead of our normal reactions where we walk by a flag, like, oh, I can't stay on that person. We see something on Facebook, we be like, they're such an idiot. You lean and be like, hey, can you help me understand? Because here's the thing, even if your brain doesn't change, I hope your compassion begins to grow. Oh, what side are you on? Neither. But here's what I do know, is that my heart for those who believe and think differently can grow. How amazing would it be to be in a world, instead of demonizing other folks, we disagreed, but it helped us love each other more. Are you for us or are you against us? Neither. But I believe Jesus is the ultimate authority and my ultimate identity. I believe all folks, Democrats, Republicans, uh, uh, Israelites, Canaanites, Raiders and even the Raiders or Niners together, all are made in God's image. And all folks, when I see something in them that's different from me, what I'm able to see is something about the image of God that I've never known or seen before because something inside of them reflects a piece of God that I've never understood. And when I'm only with people who look like me, dress like me, vote like me, I don't get to understand the full beauty of the diversity of the image of God and my view of God shrinks. I'm sorry, my view of God grows. My view of myself shrinks and I become more humble. And in that moment, it becomes what Joshua did where he falls to his knees, takes off his shoes and realizes how little he is and how big God is. And my last piece on this, and we'll move on to the next part of the scripture is this. One of my concerns is the more we focus on politics as they're done in our country today, our view of God gets smaller because we become so worried about who's gonna be the next president. And let me be be clear, whoever our next president is incredibly important. It's arguably the most influential person on the planet. We can debate that, but it's incredibly important. But here's what I do know, is throughout the history, God has used good kings and evil kings to accomplish his will. And when we believe that unless this person is elected, it's all going to, what it's telling you is you believe it's more important who sits in the great white house than important is who it is that sits on the great white throne of God's love and power. You clap for that, come on. And here's what I'm afraid happens. I'm afraid our anxiety level's getting too high because our faith is getting too low. And I'm with you. When I, when I watched that first debate, I was like, oh, Lord, help us. And what I had to realize was, well, okay, my faith in God's gotta get bigger here because my worry, my anxiety started to spin and I realized, oh, what I think is most important is who wins this. And I gotta remember my ultimate allegiance is with Jesus. Politics are incredibly important, but the tribalism is destroying our hearts from the inside out. And so instead of looking and blaming somebody else or social media, realize there is a sin condition of the human heart and you now see that and now you can do something about it. It will begin in your heart, but it won't end there. Okay, Kyle, so if this is who God is and this is the root cause, okay, what do I do with that now? I'm glad you asked. Let's keep reading. Here we go. Now we are in chapter six. Now the gates of Jericho uh, were currently barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. They're essentially, they're in siege mode, right? Then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horn in, in front of the ark? Can we talk about the ark last week? That is the, the place where God had chosen to dwell. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them blast a long blast, when you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go in, will go up and everybody straight in. 
could you imagine how Joshua was feeling? Joshua was like, okay, I've always been uh, the general and Moses has given the orders. This time I'm now the man in charge and I've got to get orders to my general. And these, I know these generals because I've fought in battle with them. And now they're coming to me looking for advice and like, all right, Joshua. All right, Jay, man, we, we've been in the trenches together. I know you've got this. Hey, what is your plan for this fight? Joshua, like, hey, here's what we do. Day one, we're just gonna walk around the city. <laughs> oh, that's good, that's good. We're gonna do some recon, right? We're gonna see where they all, that's good. Joshua, that's smart. That's right. Measure twice, cut once, that's good, okay. Um, and on the second day, we're gonna walk around the city. Oh, that's good. Make sure we didn't miss anything. I like it. Okay, 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 okay. So what are we going to do on the third day? Oh, get this, get this. Shh, don't tell anyone. We're going to walk around the city. Huh? Um, I'm sorry. I think there's a hearing issue. I just keep seeing your mouth move, and all I keep hearing is we're going to walk around the city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guess what? Guess what we're going to do on day four? Don't say it, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. He said it. Okay, four. How many days are we power walking here? Like, what are we, are we doing some calisthenics to get ready for it? He's like, day five, we're going to do it. Day six, we're going to do it again. But seven, right? Seven, the day of completion. Day seven's the day where we go in and we're going to throw down, right? No, day seven, we're going to walk it seven times. Oh, gosh. They're like, Lord, why did you take Moses home? Couldn't he have been here for this fight? Joshua is in over his head. Oh my gosh, what's going on? You look at it and say, this is the worst battle plan in history and you may not be wrong. And if the battle plan doesn't make sense, the grammar makes even less sense. What are you talking about? What does it say? I think it's verse two, if I'm not mistaken. What does it say? Then the Lord said to Jericho, see, I have delivered I have delivered. In English, this is uh, not the past tense, it's, it's the past perfect tense. The past perfect tense, uh, for those of you uh, who love grammar know, a past perfect thing is a completed action in the past. It's already been done. To which you're like, God, your battle plan doesn't make sense and neither does your grammar because I look at this and you say it has already been done, but those walls are still there, the king is still safe and we haven't plundered the city yet. And evil still reigns in those walls. What do you mean we have done it? There's something challenging about the way God chooses to do this. And it will challenge you. And I just wanna warn you, the more accomplished, the more self-reliant, and for lack of a better term, the more American you are in your ability to go and manifest destiny, this is gonna rub you the wrong way. Like, what does this mean? What God is saying here is I want you to fight a battle in a way that there's no way that you can get the credit and only I can do it. And at the end, after you've walked around, and that seventh time, if you walked around, what I want you to do is before you win the war, I want you to worship and celebrate. You're like, no, 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 no. Shouldn't I worship and celebrate after? Shouldn't it after the walls have fallen down? Like, woohoo, look at all this stuff we've done. Oh, this is awesome. That's when we sing and dance and yay, praise Jesus, right? No, 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 before it happens, because here's what God is trying to do. He's trying to shrink the amount of trust they have in themselves and grow the amount of trust that they have in God by doing it in a way that only they can do it. Why? Because if they're gonna build a society that's different than every other society, every other society says, I get to rule because I'm the strongest, smartest, or God has chosen me, therefore I'm special. And God is saying, nope, nope, nope. You get to rule not because you deserved it, because I let you. And it's not, you don't get to do it because you have power, therefore you get to exert your power over others. No, 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 What you get to do is know that God did for you what you could never do, and it's God and only God who brought these walls down. And so that's crazy, right? Yeah, but it's so crazy that it happens again. Just over a thousand years after this happened, about 1200 years after this, Jesus would come and what would he do? He would come and he would live the life you and I should have lived and died the death that you and I should have died as a punishment for our sin. And he died on the cross. And it was actually him giving his life on the cross, 
his death and then resurrection that defeated the power of sin and death and evil. And the scriptures say it this way. It says that, that what Jesus did is he broke down the walls of hostility that divided us. Two walls, he broke down the wall between us and God, that sin that divided us. That thing that in the presence of God's holiness, we just have to stop and fall to our knees and not look at him because we don't deserve it. But what he did is he said, let me show you, let me break down that wall so you can see and actually witness the God of the universe face to face in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And everyone else says, I want you to defeat the Romans. I want you to do it this way or that way. He says, no, no, no. I will do it in a way that's so countercultural that the way I do it will model how it's supposed to be done. We don't do it by military power. We do it by one and only power. And that is the power of God himself. And some of you need to hear that today especially in the context of politics. What you do and how you vote and how you volunteer and donate is important, but never believe it's more important than God's power. Some of you, you are looking at walls and you've been strategizing and walking around how to go around them. You're like, okay, I gotta find a way to get this thing down. And some of you have been walking around over and over and over and you've shouted at them, but those walls haven't come down and you're feeling overwhelmed. So what would you do? What would it look like today for you to fight in a way that's contrary to how everyone else does it, in a way that says only Jesus can break this wall down? I wonder if it might look something like looking up at that wall and seeing how big it is and trying to figure out if that person's on this side or that side. And instead of trying to figure out, all right, whose side are you on here? What would it look like if we just said, I'm just gonna walk with Jesus and I'm gonna invite you to come along with me? I'm just walking with Jesus wherever he goes and I want you to come along with it. Instead of saying, no, 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 no. You're on that side, you're on this side. Say, hey, 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 this is what I believe the heart of God is going after. Come and be a part of it. If you wanna be a part of the work of God that invites all people to love, trust, and follow him, you come and be a part of it. If you wanna be a part of a thing where God brings justice in the midst of injustice, come and be a part of it. If you wanna be a part of a thing where you don't get to be the ultimate person, where you don't get to be the king or queen of your own life, but you get to follow the one who is more powerful than any others, come and walk with me. And instead of figuring out what side of the fence you're on, inviting others to do the walk with you. One of the reasons we did this Joshua series was a um, year and a half ago, I was on a run. It was a walk run. I'm not in very good shape. And um, I came to this place where I was like, <sighs> and I stopped and I just looked up and I saw all these fields and I just heard these words from Joshua. God like just downloaded into my head and heart. He said, Kyle, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Same thing he said to Joshua, but I've given you this land ahead of you. What are you talking about? He says, hey, 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 not only are all of these fields gonna be filled with houses, they're gonna be filled with people who need to hear the love of Jesus. I said, so just wait? He said, no, 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 no. What I want you to see is the place where you've already put your feet, I have given you. And your church needs to know the same thing that God said to Joshua in chapter one, that Joshua, wherever your feet go, I will be with you and I will give that to you. We've got to be a people who realize that there is real life mission out there and sitting back and just trying to figure out what side of the wall people are on is the exact opposite of what God wants to do. And church, it's hard for me to share this way with you. And here's, here's the reason why. I really have this struggle when people, especially Jesus-loving church people, have this us and them mentality. It drives me nuts because it's clouded in this like self-righteousness, uh, we're better than other folks. And it's really hard for me to kind of use this language, us and them. So I don't know how to do it. So I just gotta share my heart with you this moment that says, some of you have seen walls that that person will never ever want to love, trust, and follow Jesus. And if you went back and saw the story a few weeks ago of Rahab, the person who we never thought would do it, and what they're waiting is for an invitation that says, will you walk with me? Will you come to church with me? Do you wanna be a part of my small group? Hey, how can I be praying for you in this? And instead of this thing where you've already decided, where you've already judged, where you've already dehumanized, for you to say, would you be interested to walk this way with me? With God in his direction, in the way that he guides Life Community Church, we are not just gonna sit back and be thrilled that we've gotta put up more chairs on Sunday. 
we're gonna be thrilled when we see that the people who leave these chairs actually go and live and embody the kingdom of God out there. You guys have been around here, you know we love serving compassion, feeding folks, we love it. You know we love youth and kids ministry and this year we're partnering with an organization called Youth for Christ and what we're doing is we've actually hired a new associate youth director who will spend part of the time working here and part of the time working for them because some of his hours will be on the school campuses meeting kids where they're at instead of waiting for them to come to us, instead of living in this wall, oh, there's this wall between God and school. No, 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 no. We believe that everywhere we go, the presence of God goes with us. And he says, no, 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 I want you to go there. And friends, I want you to have this vision that God is breaking down walls, not so that your team can win, but you can invite others to walk and follow Jesus together. And what would all this look like? What would be the result of us breaking down the walls and inviting all folks to walk? Well, let me give you a picture. Let me show you a picture of what heaven would look like. Actually, no, I said that wrong. Let me show you a picture of what heaven will look like. And you can let this decide how you live today. Let the way you live today tomorrow, this week, be shaped by let me tell you what heaven will look like. Revelation chapter seven, verse nine, uh, John has been uh, exiled to this island called Patmos and God gives him these visions so he can help the church see the thing behind the thing. And one of the things he does, he gets a glimpse of heaven. And this is what John writes in Revelation seven, verse nine, he says, after I looked there before me, there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, standing before the throne of God, before the lamb, that's Jesus who was slain for our sins. They were wearing white robes, symbolizing their purity and holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. Every tribe, tongue and nation The picture of heaven is this, it's a picture where Democrats and Republicans lose their primary identity in their politics and their primary identity becomes followers of Jesus. It's where people you've never met and who have incredibly different life backgrounds are united by the glory of God himself. It's this moment where Joshua fell to his feet because he couldn't see God because his sin was so overwhelming, so tainted his view that he couldn't see it. That now because we've been all cleansed by the blood of the lamb, we look and see Jesus himself, the lamb, the the nails in his hands, the scars in his feet, the blood that was shed for you and for me. And you realize that every single person is invited to be part of heaven. So friends, let heaven come on earth with every step you take, every conversation you have, every prayer that you pray, let the kingdom of God come on earth as it is in heaven so that through you, hearts, walls will be broken down in our hearts so that people can be built up to love and trust Jesus together. Let the walls of our heart be broken down so that we can live and invite others into this beautiful kingdom where Jesus is Lord and reigns for eternity. Let's pray. God, we confess that we've sinned against you in word, thought, and deed, in what we've done and what we've left undone. We confess that things that we've thought, said, and felt towards other folks reveals our sinful tribalism. And so God, I pray that you'd forgive us, but not just forgive us, but transform us. However you choose to do that, transform us. And Lord God, invite us to walk and see those walls fall down so that you can build us up. Lord God, let us us not live for our own glory, but for yours. So every tribe, tongue, and nation can do what we do now, stand and worship the God of the universe, 
who broke down the barriers between humans and God and built us up in a new relationship with him. Let's stand and worship together. As all God's people said,